They pointed industrial pipes at an erupting volcano and opened the floodgates. What could possibly go wrong? Iceland has a habit of doing the impossible. This tiny island nation sits on one of the most geologically violent spots on Earth, where the North American and Eurasian tectonic plates are literally tearing the island apart at the seams. Earthquakes, eruptions, and enough lava flows to make Mordor jealous. Most countries would evacuate and surrender. Iceland grabbed a fire hose. A really, really big fire hose. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's rewind to 1973, to an island called Heimami, where everything started. Picture this. It's January 23, 1973. The island of Hipponen is home to about 5,300 people, all tucked into bed. The island sits just off Iceland's southern coast, maybe seven miles from the mainland, close enough to feel safe, far enough to feel isolated. The town's economy revolves around fishing. The harbor is everything. Without it, the island dies. The ground split open. Not metaphorically. Literally, a fissure tore through the eastern part of the island, nearly a mile long, vomiting lava and ash into the freezing January night. The crack opened so close to town that people woke up to the glow of molten rock reflecting off their bedroom walls. Some thought the sun was rising early. Others assumed their neighbors' houses were on fire. Neither guess was remotely close to how bad things actually were. Within hours, the eruption was in full swing, spewing lava that flowed directly toward the town and more importantly, toward the harbor. The entire population evacuated within a single day. Fishing boats became lifeboats. The mainland was seven miles away, but in a storm with an erupting volcano behind you, it might as well have been 700. Here's where things get interesting. Most volcanic eruptions follow a script. The mountain explodes, lava flows, people flee. Eventually, maybe months or years later, the eruption stops. Everyone surveys the damage and decides whether to rebuild or abandon ship. That's the playbook. Iceland threw the playbook into the volcano. The lava was heading straight for the harbor entrance. If it blocked the entrance, the island would be finished. No harbor, no fishing industry. No fishing industry, no reason to live on a volcanic rock in the middle of the North Atlantic. The island would become a ghost town. A very expensive ghost town. Someone had an idea. An absolutely insane idea. What if they cooled the lava? Not with buckets of water like you'd see in a cartoon. With the entire ocean. The plan was simple in theory and completely bonkers in practice. Pump seawater onto the lava flow. Thousands upon thousands of gallons per minute. Cool the lava enough to stop it from advancing. Maybe even solidify it into a barrier that would redirect the remaining flow away from the harbor. Think about that for a second. They wanted to fight a volcano with a garden hose. Okay. Technically with dozens of industrial pumps and pipes. But the principle stands. This wasn't some tiny lava trickle from a science fair volcano. This was millions of tons of molten rock at temperatures exceeding 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. Rock so hot it glows. The scientific community was skeptical. That's putting it mildly. Most volcanologists thought the plan was somewhere between unlikely to work and certifiably insane. Lava doesn't just cool down because you ask it nicely. It's not a campfire. The heat capacity of molten rock is staggering. You'd need an ocean's worth of water to make a dent. Lucky for Iceland, they had an ocean. In early February, they started small, a single pump, one pipe. They sprayed seawater onto the advancing lava front and watched. The lava hissed, steam erupted in massive clouds. The outer layer of lava solidified into a black crust. And underneath that crust, the lava kept flowing. But here's the thing about that crust. It insulated the flow beneath it. The cooled exterior acted like a pipe, channeling the molten lava underneath while preventing it from spreading sideways. This was not the plan. The plan was to stop the lava entirely, not give it a convenient tunnel system. They needed more water. A lot more water. By mid-February, they had 19 pumps running. Then, 32. Then, 43. That's not a typo. Per second roughly 1.5 million gallons per hour. For context, an Olympic swimming pool holds about 660,000 gallons. They were dumping more than two Olympic pools worth of seawater onto the lava every single hour. The logistics were absurd. Pipes stretched for miles. Some were laid across still hot lava fields, 
which meant the pipes themselves would start to melt and had to be constantly repositioned. Workers operated in conditions that can only be described as apocalyptic. Toxic gases, scalding steam, chunks of lava exploding unpredictably when water hit them. Oh, and did I mention the volcano was still actively erupting the entire time? But something started to happen. The lava slowed, not everywhere, not all at once, but in specific areas where the water bombardment was heaviest, the advance stopped. The surface cooled enough to walk on, not comfortably, not safely, but walkable. They adjusted their strategy. Instead of trying to stop the entire flow, they focused on building walls. They could create barriers that would redirect the still molten lava away from the harbor. It's like trying to dam a river, except the river is liquid rock and also on fire. March rolled around. The eruption showed no signs of stopping. The lava cone, now officially named Eldfell, meaning Fire Mountain, had grown to over 200 meters tall. New lava continued to pour out daily. The town was already buried under meters of ash. Buildings collapsed under the weight. Others caught fire from the heat of nearby lava. But the harbor was still open. Barely. The entrance had narrowed significantly. But ships could still get through. The pumps kept running. The water kept flowing. Impossibly. The lava walls held. The lava flow that threatened to seal the harbor had been stopped cold. Literally. The cooled lava formed a massive barrier, and the new lava was being funneled away from the critical areas. The operation had pumped approximately 6 billion gallons of seawater onto the lava flows. 6 billion. That's enough to fill 9,000 Olympic swimming pools. The eruption finally ended in July, five months of continuous volcanic activity. When it was over, the island looked like a completely different place. Eldfell had added an entirely new mountain to the landscape. About 400 buildings were destroyed or damaged beyond repair. The island survived. More than that, the harbor actually improved. The new lava formations created a better natural windbreak, making the harbor more sheltered than it had been before. Iceland didn't just save their island, they accidentally upgraded it. This should have been the end of the story. An incredible tale of human ingenuity triumphing over nature's fury. A one-time miracle that would live in geology textbooks forever. Except Iceland didn't stop there. Fast forward to 2021, another volcanic crisis. This time on the Reykjans Peninsula, much closer to the capital, Reykjavik. After 800 years of relative calm, the region woke up angry. Earthquakes rattled the area for months. Scientists knew what was coming. The only questions were where and when. The ground split open near Mount Fagradalsferial. Tourists flocked to the site. Because Iceland being Iceland, they built hiking paths to the eruption and called it a tourist attraction. Only in Iceland do you get Instagram selfies with an active volcano. That eruption was relatively contained, spectacular to watch but not immediately threatening to infrastructure. The lava flowed into empty valleys. Everyone relaxed. Crisis averted. Then came 2023. The Reykjans Peninsula erupted again, and again, multiple eruptions in rapid succession. The lava started threatening the town of Grindavik, a fishing community of about 3,800 people, and nearby sat the Savartsenji Geothermal Power Plant, which provides electricity and hot water to tens of thousands of people, including the entire Reykjans Peninsula. If that power plant went down, it wouldn't just be a local problem, it would be a regional catastrophe and the lava was heading straight for it. Someone remembered 1973. Someone remembered Jaime. Someone asked the question that seemed insane 50 years ago, but now sounded almost reasonable. Can we do it again? The situations weren't identical, predictable in its flow direction. The Reykjanes eruptions were more chaotic, with lava emerging from multiple fissures. But the principle remained. Cool, the lava. Redirect the flow protect the critical infrastructure. They started building barriers, not lava barriers this time, but massive earthen walls constructed from volcanic rock and soil. Bulldozers worked around the clock, piling up defensive walls between the likely lava paths and the power plant. Some walls were 15 meters high and hundreds of meters long. It looked like medieval siege preparation, except they were defending against a dragon made of geology. But they also brought back the water strategy. Not at the scale of 1973, 
Not yet. But they had pumps ready. Industrial systems capable of moving massive quantities of water on short notice. The plans were drawn. The equipment was staged. If the lava came too close, they'd flood it. In November 2023, a fissure opened terrifyingly close to Grindavik. The town evacuated. Lava flowed toward the defensive barriers. The walls held. Barely. The lava found easier paths and flowed away from the town. For now, December brought another eruption. January 2024. Another. The town of Grindavik has been evacuated and re-evacuated multiple times. Some residents have moved back during calm periods only to flee again when the ground starts shaking. It's like living on a geologic yo-yo. But the power plant remains operational. The barriers held. And every time there's a new eruption, Iceland's engineers are ready with their pumps and pipes, prepared to turn the ocean into a weapon against the volcano if necessary. Here's what makes this absolutely fascinating. Iceland isn't fighting nature. They're negotiating with it. They understand they live on a volcanic island. They know the eruptions will continue. The North American and Eurasian plates are pulling apart at a rate of about 2 centimeters per year. That's not stopping. The mantle plume beneath Iceland isn't going anywhere. So instead of fleeing or surrendering, they adapted. They developed techniques to manage volcanic eruptions the way other countries manage floods or hurricanes. Its disaster response meets geological engineering meets absolute audacity. The science behind cooling lava is more complex than just dumping water on hot rock. When water hits lava, it doesn't just cool it. It fragments it. The rapid temperature change causes the outer layer to crack and shatter. This creates more surface area, which allows more water to contact more lava, which accelerates the cooling process. It's a cascading effect, but you have to be careful. Too much water too fast can cause steam explosions. The water turns to steam so quickly that it expands violently, throwing chunks of lava in every direction. That's why the operation in 1973 ramped up gradually. They tested. They adjusted. They learned in real time how to fight a volcano. The technique has limitations. It works best on slow-moving Pajo lava. The smoother, less viscous type. Faster, more fluid lava can overwhelm the cooling efforts. And if the eruption rate is too high, pumping all the water in the ocean won't stop it. You're bailing out a sinking ship with a teaspoon. With the right equipment and enough water, you can redirect tons of molten rock. You can build barriers out of the very thing trying to destroy you. You can turn your enemy into your defense. Other countries have taken notice. When Mount Niragongo threatened the city of Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2002, scientists discussed using similar techniques. The infrastructure wasn't there. The expertise wasn't available. The lava reached Lake Kivu and stopped on its own. But the conversation had started. Hawaii, which deals with volcanic eruptions regularly, has studied Iceland's methods extensively. The difference is that Hawaiian eruptions often occur in less developed areas, and the philosophy has traditionally been to let the lava go where it wants. But as development encroaches on volcanic zones, that philosophy may need to evolve. Japan, sitting on the ring of fire with active volcanoes threatening populated areas, has incorporated Iceland's lessons into their disaster planning. The 1973 Hemacy operation is now taught in volcanic crisis management courses worldwide. Iceland proved something that seems obvious in hindsight, but was revolutionary at the time. Volcanic eruptions aren't entirely beyond human influence. We can't stop them. We probably shouldn't try. But we can nudge them, guide them, negotiate terms. The key is understanding the volcano's behavior. Lava flows follow topography like water. It takes the path of least resistance. By creating artificial high resistance zones through cooling and barriers, you can persuade the lava to go elsewhere. It's not about stopping the unstoppable. It's about convincing it to go around. The environmental implications are interesting too. Dumping billions of gallons of seawater onto lava creates enormous amounts of steam and releases various gases. The seawater itself contains salt, which at high temperatures can produce hydrochloric acid vapor. Not great for lungs. The workers in 1973 wore respirators when possible. But the conditions were so chaotic that safety protocols were more guidelines than rules. Despite this, the ecological damage was relatively minimal compared to letting the lava destroy the harbor and town. The ocean is massive. The amount of water they used was significant in human terms. 
but barely measurable in oceanic terms. And the gases released were temporary compared to the long-term economic and environmental benefits of preserving the island's infrastructure. What happened in Iceland represents a shift in how we think about natural disasters. For most of human history, we've been reactive. We cope with the aftermath. But Iceland moved toward proactive disaster management. They didn't wait to see if the lava would stop on its own. They intervened. This raises philosophical questions. Should we interfere with natural processes? Where's the line between adaptation and hubris? The eruption on Himani was going to happen regardless. The lava was going to flow. Iceland's intervention didn't cause additional harm. It prevented it. They didn't stop the eruption. They just changed where the lava ended up. Some might argue this is playing God. Others would say it's just good engineering. The reality is probably somewhere in between. It's humans using intelligence and tools to protect themselves from a hostile environment. We've been doing that since we discovered fire and built shelters. Iceland just scaled it up to include fighting volcanoes with ocean water. The economic argument is straightforward. The cost of the pumping operation in 1973 was expensive, but nowhere near the cost of losing the island's primary industry. The return on investment was staggering. For the Reykjane situation, protecting the power plant isn't optional. The economic and social costs of losing that facility would be catastrophic. So where does this leave us? Iceland continues to sit on one of the most volcanically active regions on Earth. The eruptions will continue. The ground will keep splitting open. Lava will keep flowing. But now Iceland has a playbook. They know it's possible to influence where that lava goes. The next time a volcano threatens critical infrastructure anywhere in the world, people will remember Iceland. They'll remember that tiny island nation that looked at an erupting volcano and said, not here you don't. They'll remember the industrial pipes, the millions of gallons of seawater, and the absolute audacity to fight liquid rock with ocean water. And they'll remember it worked, because Iceland didn't just bring the ocean to an erupting volcano. They brought human ingenuity, determination, and a healthy dose of don't tell us it can't be done attitude. They took a natural disaster and turned it into a case study. They faced impossible odds and said, watch this. That's the story of how Iceland fought a volcano with seawater and won. Twice. And they're ready to do it again if needed. Because when you live on a volcanic island in the North Atlantic, you either learn to work with the fire beneath your feet, or you move. And Icelanders aren't moving.